If light were dark, and dark were light, the moon a black hole in the blaze of night, a raven's wing as bright as tin, then you, my love, would be darker than sin. I remember everything. I remember everything! I remember every little thing as if it happened only yesterday. I was barely 17. I was barely 17 and I once killed a boy with a Fender guitar. I don't remember if it was a Telecaster or a Stratocaster, but I do remember that it had a heart of chrome and a voice like a horny angel. I don't remember if it was a Telecaster or a Stratocaster, but I do remember that it wasn't at all easy. It required the perfect angle and the precise power chords. The guitar bled for about a week afterward, and the blood was, ooh, dark and rich like wild berries. The blood of the guitar was chuck berry red. The guitar bled for about a week afterward, but it rung out beautifully. And I was able to play notes that I had never even heard before. So I took my guitar and I smashed it against the wall. I smashed it against the floor. I smashed it against the hood of a car. I smashed it against the body of a varsity cheerleader. Smashed it against the 1989 Harley Davidson. The Harley howled in pain. The guitar howled in heat. And I ran up the stairs to my parents' bedroom. Mummy and Daddy were sleeping in the moonlight. Slowly I turned, step by step. I opened the door, creeping in the shadows, right up to the foot of the bed. I raised the guitar high above my head, and just as I was about to bring the guitar crashing down upon the center of the bed, my father woke up screaming, Stop! Wait a minute! Stop it, boy! What do you think you're doing? That's no way to treat an expensive musical instrument! And I said, God damn it, Daddy! You know I love you. But you've got a hell of a lot to learn about rock and roll! Hello, I'm Jim Steinman, and I'm actually here to talk to you about an album that I've just completed. And I'm not sure how many of you know who I am. Uh, Jim Steinman is, um, <laughs> uh, he's pretty cool, he's a pretty cool guy, but he still owes me money. I've done uh, a lot of production and writing, which you may or may not be aware of. Uh, Meatloaf, uh, Bonnie Tyler, Sisters of Mercy, and, uh, and that's not important. What's important is the record I have to talk about is a record I've just completed called Original Sin with a group that I put together called Pandora's Box. Pandora's Box is always one of my favorite myths, and that's why I thought this would be a great name for this group. I really wanted to do a girls' group very badly. Either that or I just really wanted girls. I'm not sure which it was, but I was trying to combine professional and personal concerns. And uh, I really wanted to do a group like, the, when I was growing up, one of the biggest groups to me was the Shangri-Las. Shangri-Las were the favorite group I ever grew up with. Just when I was reaching puberty, they wore black leather, they had long blonde hair, they were really filthy, they came from Queens, New York. Everyone in Queens, New York is really filthy, but not everyone in Queens, New York wears leather. That's the reason they were stars, and the other people in Queens are real schmucks. The Shangri-Las were definitely bad girls. They had spoken words. That was the record where people said, how did, how did he look? And she said, he looked real good. And then she said, how does he dance? And she said, close, real close. And I thought that was the sexiest words I ever heard in my life. It was the first record I ever heard that was like a little mini drama, like a mini opera. Opera. Oh, I grew up listening to opera and rock and roll at the same time. I listened to Richard Wagner. I listened to Little Richard, so it came out as Little Richard Wagner, <laughs> and it was great. I couldn't tell the difference. I thought all rock and roll was really operatic. I thought all opera was really rock and roll. They were both really physical. They're both excessive. I love things that are excessive. I sort of started that point and worked my way up. <laughs> to me, it's like a teenage prayer. Um, it ain't right, it ain't fair, castles fall in the sand and we fade in the air, and the good girls go to heaven, but the bad girls go everywhere. I really like the balance of light and dark when you get a sense of both things, the tension between the things. A lot of times it's been written that my music's violent, and even though it's not nearly as violent as a lot of other music, I think it's emotionally violent. I just always thought that uh, treating love and, and sex and songs it was pretty appropriate to treat them fairly darkly because they're pretty dangerous things. Sex and love are dangerous and good and uh, it's 
a pretty basic fact that in the last few years everyone's aware, especially that, that love has potential to kill, or sex does. But I think there's a pretty cool aspect of that too, simply in that it makes people aware how it always was dangerous emotionally, if nothing else. It was never safe emotionally. It was never safe because you surrender yourself, you reveal yourself, and that is fucking dangerous. Twenty Seventy Fox is the Doors. The Doors were my favorite male group, even though they, they were right on the borderline. But they were my favorite male group. Jim Morrison was my idol when I was growing up. I spent a lot of time trying to look like Jim Morrison. I really failed miserably, obviously. But I used to sit around and brood in front of a mirror and practice at it. Uh, 20th Century Fox was on their very first album. It was a really cool song, I thought. I thought it was the image of what like every studly person should be like, 20th Century Fox. It has uh, one great phrase in it. Um, no tears, no fears, no ruined years, no clocks. I don't know if Tears for Fears got their name from that, but they don't deserve it if they did. Part of the uh, desire to do something dark and erotic as opposed to light and frilly is that there's a reaction to all the records that are out there, all these tinny sounding little records with all these kittenish little girl singers that ever since Madonna just seems to be everywhere. The most terrifying thing about the record industry really isn't their fault. It's, it's the whole nature of this beast, the way that this industry can absorb things so quickly and devour it. Uh, this, the amazing consumption that takes place is really scary. I've been producing now for uh, 12 years, and uh, David Foster, the producer, once said, if you can last for five years, it's amazing. It's just so much veracity to grab things and this huge appetite, like a giant maw of a mouth out there that, that devours stuff. That's the thing that's scary. It's, there's, um, there's a joke that, that, that relates to that. There's, um, relates to how we devour things. There's um, a guy walking along the street, and he sees this guy coming toward him, his best friend, and he's got this pig by his side. And the guy says, oh, Bill, I haven't seen you in so long. It's so good to see you. And he says, oh, it's really good to see you, too. I've been fine. How have you been? He says, I've been wonderful. I've been wonderful. He says, you know, that's an incredible looking pig. That's a beautiful pig. He said, this pig? This pig is more than beautiful. This is the most amazing pig. This is the most fanatical, magnificent, brilliantly loyal pig. This is the greatest pig that ever lived. The greatest. He says, well, it certainly looks like an extraordinary pig to me. He says, well, it is. It's absolutely exceptional. He says, what, um, I just do have one question about the pig, though. How did the pig get one uh, wooden leg? How did that happen? He says, well, you know, let me tell you about this pig. That I have to really explain to you how great this pig is. Uh, three weeks ago, when I first got this pig, I was, I was out driving on Mulholland Drive in Los Angeles, very windy roads, and I had been drinking. I shouldn't have been drinking, I suppose, and I wasn't driving too well. And Well, I took one of those real fast turns around a real steep cliff, and I, I just did it really badly, and I started to go over the cliff, and I would have died in a horrible, fiery crash, I'm sure of it, just as we're going over the edge. The pig, this great pig, lunges over with his big snout, grabs the wheel, lunges to the right, and with his big hooves, he pushes down on the brake. Just as we were toppling over, it stops with a screech, saved my life. This beautiful pig just saved my life like that. I mean, I can't believe it. It's a, a wonderful pig. He said, well, it's certainly a great pig. Boy, what a story. Well, you know, if you don't have those little kittenish rock and roll singers, the Madonna clones, you get all these, um, these groups, especially in America, though I suspect there's some here, the sort of heavy metal posers, but the women's heavy metal posers, which is so bizarre because what you have is all these girls and groups trying to look like the guys in the groups who are trying to look like girls acting like guys. So you have these girls dressing up and making up like John Bon Jovi, who of course looks like a guy dressing like a girl, but you have the girls dressing like the guys who are looking like the girls but acting like the guys. So it bec becomes such a, a terrifying gender confusion. You just don't know who to fuck, and I think it's really embarrassing. And I think it should be stopped, and I think they should all be arrested. You know, it's just one question. How did the pig get that uh, one wooden leg? He says, well, you know, the other thing, just last night, just last night, my wife and I were having a barbecue outside, and we were grilling meats on the barbecue grill, and, um, and all of a sudden, I hear the screaming from inside the kitchen where my wife went in to wash some dishes, and uh, it turns out she had put her hand down in the trash compactor and gotten it caught with the sleeve, and, well, her hand was just about to be totally shredded and mutilated, and all of a sudden, the pig runs inside from outside with its big snout and pushes her hand right outside of the trash compactor. With its hooves, it pushes her down on the ground and made sure that it turned off the trash compactor and she was totally safe. I mean, she would have lost her arm, no doubt about it. The pig saved her life, just like that. He said, that's, that's amazing. What a pig. He said, oh, you're telling me, what a pig. It's the greatest pig. I, it's unbelievable. This pig is magnificent. He says, I just, that one question, how did the pig get one wooden leg? He said, well, a uh, pig like that, you don't eat it all at once. And it seemed to me that um, what this business does is it eats even the most beautiful pigs, usually all at once, sometimes one leg at a time. But the hardest thing may be to survive that big banquet. <laughs>